Hello, everyone. Good evening to you guys. Welcome back to the Mob Archaeologists. Today, we're going to continue with the second letter from Giuseppe Morello. This was written on November 15th, 1909, and addressed to Mr. Vincenzo Marici at 535 South Franklin Street in New Orleans, Louisiana. And the letter starts, Dear friend, am in possession of your two letters, one that bears the date of the 5th, the other on the 10th of November. I understand the contents. In regard to being able to reorganize the family, for me, I advise you all to do it because it seems it is not just to stay without a king or country, but I authorize you to convey to all my humble prayer and my weak opinion, but well understood that those that are worthy and those that wish to belong, those that do not wish to belong, let them go. Okay, the, the letter talks about being in possession of two letters. Giuseppe Morello is in possession of two letters uh, from uh, Vincenzo Morecci. And uh, Vincenzo Morecci was the, uh, we believe, the boss of New Orleans. He, it'll talk about that. Uh, we'll go into more detail about that further on in this letter. Um, but he was uh, the, the New Orleans boss from, we believe, 1908 or 1909 to 1915. Uh, he, he was born in uh, 1856 and uh, came to America in the 1880s and was heavily involved in uh, in the uh, local, uh, we'll call it the early Cosa Nostra Society in New Orleans. Uh, he was a banana inspector at the wharf for Charlie Matranga, of the uh, well-known Matranga family was the uh, Stevedore, the uh, head of the Longshoremen. And so he had the contract, and that was the fight, uh, the well-known fight involved in uh, in 1890 that led to the death of uh, Chief David Hennessy and the uh, subsequent uh, lynching of the, uh, the 11 Sicilians in the... Uh, in the prison where they were held. So he go he has a long pedigree. He goes way back. And so he's uh replacing Francesco Motisi, who was the uh boss who came from Bagliarelli, connected to Ignacio Lupo. And he ran the family from about 1903. Uh he left in 1908 uh after uh, being accused of being involved in the kidnapping of uh, of the Lamana boy, who ended up being killed as part of a black hand extortion scheme. So, uh, so there's a lot going on, and uh, so, so the first thing Morello talks about in regard to being to reorganizing the family. He's taking over from Francesco Motisi. And so apparently he wants to clean it out. Uh, maybe there were people that were not that involved. Maybe he wants to put his own people in. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, it's it's nice to get this sort of, uh, you know, kind of background because we know that New Orleans uh, is remembered as the, the oldest mafia family in the country and has, uh, you know, before New York, Overtook it towards the end of the the, the nineteenth century. Um, New Orleans was the primary port of entry for Sicilian and other Italian immigrants into the U.S. And uh, you know, as I think was essentially a linchpin for the uh, the spread of the mafia, you know, throughout the Midwest, the South, and the West of the of the U.S. So uh, this is important history because we don't know a lot really about early New Orleans. We just know it was important and it was connected all over the country and connected back to Sicily, of course. Um, I would add, of course, that uh, uh, the Vincenzo Morici was a uh, he was born, like Rick said, about 1856 in Termini Merese, which is on, you know, just to the east of of, uh, of Bagaria, essentially, you know, Travia, some of these other towns to the east along the coast from the city of Palermo. 
um, and was a really important hotbed along with Bagaria of, of mafia activity, you know, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and up until today. Um, it was where the mafioso politician uh, Rafael Palizzolo was from. And I think this is, uh, for me, it's an important part of the context, maybe for somebody like Morici, because the people from Termini Mereze, the Termitani, were very influential early on in Chicago also. I think they formed a core part of the, uh, you know, the Chicago mafia, as well as the, the broader Sicilian community in the late 19th into early 20th centuries. They also, they seem to have been important in New Orleans, and it wasn't just Morici, they had uh, organized uh, Italian Paisani societies in New Orleans that I think as with Chicago and with other cities uh, had a lot of interpenetration and connections with the mafia, right? Um, you know, they were probably instruments to some degree of mafia control and influence in society and in local politics. And we know that Vincenzo Morici in the, from the 1880s through the early 1900s, um, he was noted as an official in a number of these Italian Paisani in social societies in New Orleans. He was the president of the Termini Marezzi Society. He was a secretary or president or vice president in several other influential clubs uh, on the executive committee of like the Columbus Day Parade and of the Italian festival that was held annually. And in the 1890s, he was actually involved in a massive brawl that happened um, that led to a guy from Northern Italy being murdered um, in New Orleans uh, that appears to have been a fight for who would be appointed the officials in the Columbus Day Parade. And there was uh, Gaetano, Matranga, who I believe was one of these, uh, I don't think that was Charlie Matranga, right? There was a guy, Atano Matranga, that was an important guy. And uh, he apparently, there was a group of people supporting him and they got into a brawl and stabbed the guy and killed him. And apparently uh, Vincenzo Morici was the one who instigated it by hurling insults and then assaulting somebody else. So a number of these uh, early mafiosi, I think in New Orleans as in other cities, I think were very active in the Italian societies, which is an important part of, uh, I think, their uh, their social and political power. So, I mean, he has a decades long history by the time that uh, the Morello is writing him, I think, with the mafia and also as a really important person socially and politically within the Italian Sicilian community in, in New Orleans. Yeah, and I mean, Termini Imeresi is, uh, you know, doesn't get as much attention tension, but it seems to have played a very pivotal role in the development of the U.S. mafia going back to the 1800s. It shows up in a lot of what we believe to be the earliest known families, and many of them were heavily involved in the citrus industry. They were very entrepreneurial, very upper class, what you would call the Alta Mafia. Rick, you said he was a banana inspector, is that right? Yeah, he was a banana inspector in the wharf. Very typical. Charlie uh, Matranga. Yeah, they were, they were very heavily involved. People from Termini were very heavily involved in the banana industry. So that's very unsurprising. I want to look at the actual, what, what that paragraph, paragraph actually said. He says, in regard to being able to reorganize the family, and this goes back to one of the earlier episodes we did, where we see that language a lot, this reorganization. He says, you know, to be without a king nor country. And, uh, you know, there's this perception that when a boss dies or is deposed or has to step down, in this case, you know, Motizi left the country, correct? Uh, you know, the family is not seen as recognized. It's not seen as organized. And when a new boss takes over, we know, and this continued for decades in New York, different families, technically all of the high ranking posts are removed people are, are removed from their high ranking posts evidently everybody except for the conciliary so the family really isn't properly organized like we know the family still exists there are still amici who exist in that location but they're not properly recognized until they have a new boss who can you know kind of cement people back into ranking positions and all that something i also find funny about this is the false humility you know morello says my weak opinion it's almost, it almost, it's like the godfather, Don Finucci, you know, oh no, there's this false humility. You see that a lot with these guys where this is the capo, this is the national capo. And, you know, on one hand, we know the capo didn't have maybe the level of absolute authority to control everything. And he, he was kind of seen as an advisor, but we also know that the capo could be a tyrant, but there's this kind of this, this false humility you see in a lot of these communications, in my weak opinion. This is Giuseppe Morello. His opinion isn't weak, but he has to say that. It's kind of part of the protocol. 
is to act like, oh, this is just, I'm just a guy with an opinion. But in reality, he's the guy who's been elected to the top post in the entire American mafia. Well, if I okay. were to say one thing about this, when he talks about reorganizing it, it makes me wonder if he's referring to certain office positions within the organization. And it seems like, or the article kind of implies that this new boss doesn't have the full support. So Morello is kind of lending his political strength by stating that he should repeat to everyone that it is Morello's weak opinion that they should go along with what Marici is attempting to do. One more thing before we go on to the next one. I, I wanted to hit on that. Those that wish to belong and those that do not wish to belong, let them go. And what that might mean, you know, I wouldn't necessarily assume it means the guys who aren't going to go along are going to be shelved. But we know there was a lot of fluidity as far as like where guys lived and where they went. And one guy in particular at this time who had been part of New Orleans up and right up until this this time was Vincenzo Capetta. And he went to Kansas City around 1909. So he went, he left New Orleans right around this time. And he had significant issues many years later with roots in New Orleans with a member of the New Orleans family at this time who will be mentioned in this letter. So it's possible that when he says let them go, some of these guys might have literally left New Orleans and transferred to other families. And I think Vincenzo Capetta is a good candidate. He might not have agreed with the leadership some of the issues that existed between him and Vito De Giorgio, who will come up in this letter, might have roots in what was going on at the time. We don't know exactly what the issue was, but there might have been some some resentment at this time and guys left or they were told to leave. We don't really know whether if a guy didn't want to go along with the program, he might have been encouraged uh, under threat of death to, to leave the area. So you can read that a number of different ways. Maybe guys could have been shelved, but you have to belong somewhere. And if you don't go along with the program, the new regime, there aren't many options. He could have requested a transfer to a different group. Yeah. Yeah. I would also just um, real quick as a sort of piggyback on Eric's comments earlier, the um, w when I, when I first read this letter, one of the things I thought of uh, the idea of reorganizing the family to me, it sort of uh, echoed, or it didn't echo because it's preceding it, you know, in time. But it reminds me of the the later comments um, by by Nicola Gentile of after Salvatore Maranzano becomes, uh, you know, capo de capi of the the National Mafia. That he, as Gentile put it, or translated into English, was he he formed the Borgata, right? And we know that those Borgata, meaning the five families in New York, that those those families long preexisted it. Uh, this moment in 1931, we've had, you know, whole episodes dealing with this, right? So what does Gentile mean by form the Borgata? It's that the new bosses were appointed. And so at least in a uh, formal sense, those Borgata were sort of re reconstituted. So each time a boss is put in, because the family and the, its members are actually represented within the national mafia system through the boss. That's why the boss is the representante, right? So when a new boss is put in, that boss is now a new medium of representation for the family. And I think that until a, a, an official boss can be ratified, um, that the family is essentially, at least in a, a formal sense, in a quasi limbo state. Yep. And, and we also know that when the new boss comes in, aside from the conciliary, that that, that new boss, it's within his prerogative to, to uh, appoint or demote new captains, because essentially all of those positions are now in a state of flux. New captains can be appointed, new crews can be formed or broken down underboss appointed, right? So it, there is a, I mean, even though those Borgata existed, they're sort of in a state of flux. And then when the new boss comes in, at least in theory, that 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 new boss is able to sort of reform the family. And that is a reorganization. So I think that kind of points to the same concept that Gentile touched on later. Definitely. Yes. Yeah, in a way the boss recreated it in his own image. You tell me that from Palermo arrived good news. I nor the others of New York have not been formally advised. Therefore, I beg of you to tell me something about the news from Palermo. Who has written and whether any commission has decided to come? I have advised my godfather, Lagatura, to have in sight 
the one from Morreale. I advise you further that in your last letter, I understood minutely and by wire and signed the affair of the friend Vincenzo Antinoro. It is well now we are well understood. Now for the present, the most interesting thing that I desire and expect is the declaration or statement of Giovanni Golota regarding the affair Costantino and Trombone declaration made and signed by his own hands of Giovanni Golota. And then if we are there, it's a wonder. Yeah, and going over this section of the letter, it, it looks like there was a uh, group from Palermo that arrived with good news, whatever the act consists of. And then he's talking about uh, not just his specific Borgata, but he might have been talking about the various Borgatas in New York being advised uh, about some news from Palermo. Uh, I don't think it has anything to do with Francesco Motisi yet. Uh, when he left New Orleans, he went to Liverpool, England for a while before returning to Palermo. And I believe he was still in England at that time. Uh, and then he, uh, going on, he refers to his godfather, Lagotute. And Lagotute might have been uh, somebody in New York uh, that uh, we're, Angel and I are familiar with, uh, Angel Lagotuda. Uh, that's who the name most resembles. Uh, we don't know what's meant by Godfather, since we don't have the original Italian. This letter has uh, been uh, translated into English and was published that way in uh, the book, The Barrel Mystery. So that's where we're going on. So was the original word uh, padrino, or was it uh, something of a compadre? You know, it's, it's used in Spanish, uh, compare, uh, which would literally be co-father. Uh, that's the more frequent term, but uh, an early informant in Secret Service did notice that they call each other godfathers. But again, we didn't have the Italian word that was being used. We had the English translation. So, um, but it was common uh, for members to refer to each other that way. Or uh, because it, I believe Angel Negatuda uh, like was approximately the same age as Morello, and I, he certainly didn't hold a higher position in uh, in New York. So, uh, Godfather is somebody to look up to, uh, as in the movie Godfather. Uh, that doesn't appear to be the case. And uh, then he goes to have in sight of the one from Morreale. Uh, that's most likely Monreal, which is uh, the home of the Stupaglieri, a group that uh, was meant to rival the Mafia and end up merging with it. And it's uh, located uh, next to Palermo. And they were active in New Orleans. And Chinto Antinoro. Uh, there were a number of Antinoros in Tampa, Florida. Uh, we don't have much information on this person, so we don't know if he's connected to that group of Antinoros. In my research, I have not found anyone by that name in New Orleans. And then there's a... Uh, Statement of Giovanni Golota uh, regarding the affair of Constantino. Now, we uh, talked about Collegio Constantino last week, uh, that uh, he was uh, at that time associated with Chicago, and now he's in New Orleans, apparently hiding out for some reason, and uh, apparently staying with Giovanni Golota. Now, Giovanni Golotta, 
uh, lived in Bogalusa, Bogalusa uh, near Mississippi. And uh, his daughter was married to uh, uh, Salta Formaggio, member of the Salta Formaggio family. And they, in turn, were married to the Terranova family. Mm. So the Terranovas was where uh, Bernardo Terranova was a stepfather of Giuseppe Morello and Vincento Nicola and uh, Ciro Terranova were all half brothers to Giuseppe Morello. So very important family. Yeah. So, I mean, the previous episode we did on the, the letter to Chicago uh, boss, we don't know if he was boss. He was probably also like uh, Morici, newly installed as boss in 1909 in Chicago, Rosario Dispenza from Chimina. Uh, that's where Rick is uh, referencing the, the discussion we had about, about Calogio Constantino, who was from Corleone, um, like Morello, but uh, whose family um, originally was from Partinico. And uh, I wonder too, the tromboni that's mentioned here, if that's tromboni or if that's trombatori which would be another, that's a very important name from Corleone associated with the mafia. Um, of course, there was a New Orleans boss, Leo Luca, you know, Trombatore, and there are other, Leo Luca is a very common name, it's the patron saint of Corleone, so that's not, he's not the only person with that exact name, but there was a person by that name in, in Chicago, there was Trombatores in Chicago from Corleone that seemed to have been connected to the mafia-connected uh, Corleone Paisani Society, uh, the Societa San Leo Luca di Corleone in Chicago, and uh, relatives of theirs, I believe, were also connected to the mob in Rockford. So that tr the, the Trombatori family has connections, I think, all over the country. Um, I'm not sure if Tromboni is somebody else, but that's what I wondered when I first read this. Uh, Giovanni Golota, I think, should be from Sambuca, right? Am I correct on that? Yeah. From Sambuca, it was called Sambuca Sabut. It was renamed under the fascist, fascist regime because I guess they didn't like the Arabic derived Zabut. So they called it, they renamed it Sambuca de Sicilia. But uh, Sambuca Sabut was uh, a really important town in the early history of the mafia. Maybe Eric will discuss that a little bit. Um, again, another town that had, um, I mean, a lot of people came in through New Orleans and were in New Orleans as well as rural parts of Louisiana from Sambuca and from neighboring you know, Comuni and, and Western Agrigento province. Um, Chicago had two bosses from Sambuca, Michele Merlo in the 1920s, and then much later in the 1990s, Johnny Apes Monteleone was also born in, in Sambuca. And uh, it's one of these, another one of these early towns that I think was very important in a number of cities in the US and the mafia, which again, many of them connect. All these different Paisani groups almost all connect to New Orleans because everybody was in New Orleans. Right. Um, so that's important. This is probably because this is probably the same Collegio Constantino that we had talked about before, the one from Corleone that was connected to Chicago and seemed to be in some sort of trouble in New Orleans or in Louisiana and Bogalusa. But I also wonder because this is this is March of 1909 that this letter was was written. Is that correct? November. No, yeah. November. OK. Yeah. Because so March of 1909 was when Joe Petrosino was killed in um in in Sicily, right? The New York City detective that was murdered in Sicily, right? That was March of 1909, if I'm not mistaken. And another, as we discussed also in the last episode, there was another Calogero Constantino who could have been related to the one um, that was you know connected to Chicago and New Orleans, but he was from Partinico, um, and he was uh, one of the people that was implicated, you know, reputedly in the murder of uh, of Joe Petrosino. So I did wonder also if this is which Constantino this is referring to, given that it's 1909. I'm assuming that it's the one who is hiding out in, in Louisiana because of the mention of, of Galota, right? Yeah, Carlo Constantino, also, so just real quick, Carlo Constantino is slightly different spelling on his last name where uh, right, this guy right. had an N. I mean, it could be, it doesn't necessarily mean they're a different name. We know these variations exist, but slightly different name. Just Carlo Constantino is missing that letter N near the beginning. That's who knows? Oh, Const yeah, Constantino. And then Carlo, Carlo Giorgio are just are two different versions of the same given name, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, uh, I wonder, because when he, when, at the beginning of this paragraph, when Morello says, uh, you tell me that from Palermo arrived good news. I wonder if that good news could have been related to the Petrosino event or something. Good thinking. You know? 
just because it is it, it's a few months later, but you know, news could have traveled a little bit slowly, right? Or the investigation. Invest, yeah, something related to the fallout from it or something, right? I mean, I, that would have been something that I think would have been a, a topic of discussion and concern both between Palermo and, and the various families in the U.S. Good guess. Yeah. I agree. Yeah, and that, that part about arrive good news and Morello himself says he hasn't been formally advised, whether that means he was informed casually and just, you know, the, like some sort of formal delegation didn't come to him yet. Because he mentions whether any commission has decided to come. And we know from some early sources like Salvatore Clemente, who was a made member of uh, Morello's family, who was cooperating a few years after this, that they would use, they would form these temporary commissions. In one case, even a commission of one. Clemente, Angelo could comment on this, but Clemente himself was tasked by the interim capo to be a commission of one to investigate a guy. So they would form these temporary commissions. We know they did that in the 1920s. Gentile talks about being on a couple of them where they could be tasked with trying to mediate a national dispute with investigating a particular matter. And, you know, they, they kind of did that later in the official capital C commission era too, where they would sometimes delegate three guys to, um, you know, arbitrate or to carry messages. You know, Joe Bonanno talked about that, where it has to be three guys. If it's two, it's not official. It's not formal, which could play into, you know, what Morello is saying. I have not been formally advised. Maybe he had been advised in some capacity, but not formally. But it shows you the level of communication that was going on between Palermo and the U.S. at that time. And it tells you also, though, that that information might go to a certain location. And this is a particularly crucial period because the first decade of the 1900s might have been when the national power officially switched to New York from New Orleans. Because, I mean, keep in mind, this is, what, 1909. The New Orleans family had existed for, what, like uh, 60 years at this point? Easily around 60 years, 50, 60 years. And it's likely that whatever national governing bodies existed in the 1800s were probably centered in New Orleans. So this this signifies a significant power switch and maybe some information was still going to New Orleans because of those connections that existed there. Uh, you mentioned Sambuca. You say Gulata was from Sambuca? I'm yeah. far from an expert on the old New Orleans stuff, but that's my impression. My understanding was he was, he was from Sambuca. We know that name it is... A, a Sambuca name, which is, uh, you know, it appears in Rockford and some other places also, right? Yeah, Sambuca is interesting because I think I might have mentioned this in another episode, but uh, in one of John Dickey's books, he mentions how these two mainland investigators went to Sicily to investigate the mafia, and they were told, just go to Sambuca and stand in the town square, and you will basically see the process of the mafia unfold. It doesn't get a lot of attention, though, but it, it did play a pivotal role early on, and it's in western Agrigento. It's in this kind of crucial border interprovincial area where lower Palermo province, um, southern Tropani, and western Agrigento meet, and a lot of early Cosa Nostra families in the U.S. were part of that early network where, where those provinces meet. Uh, you know, you mentioned early Chicago guys were from there, not just Sambuca, but there's some neighboring villages. There's Ribera, there's Villa Franca. There wasn't a guy we think may have been another early Chicago boss from Villa Franca. And then decades later, you have guys like Carlos Marcello's family was from Eastern Agrigento. But you have a number of these guys who show up later in what's left of New Orleans in the 60s who trace themselves to Agrigento. But we don't have a lot of information on Agrigento early in New Orleans history. We know it had to be there. Agrigento is is just a, the whole the whole province is a mafia stronghold. Sambuca was obviously instrumental in the Sicilian mafia at that time, based on what we know. So this is an indication Agrigento was part of things. But as is pretty typical of Agrigento, they barely leave a trace. But here we, if Gulata was from there, that shows that Agrigento was present. They're part of the conversation. Well, one thing I'd like to add is when looking into New Orleans guys in the 1960s, you will find a few that are first or second generation, but there are some that go back three generations or sometimes even four generations. And there were some families that 
would move between New Orleans and Birmingham, Alabama, and eventually move back. Um, so there was that connection there. There was also connections to Dallas, Texas, and also Kansas City. And mm -hmm. by the 1960s with New Orleans, I don't want to go too far ahead here, but, um, but in the 1960s, you had a lot of different groups, you know, Chicago, New York, other cities that had members or associates that were active down in New Orleans. Well, Carlos Marcello ran a very small, very, um, you know, compact organization with very few memberships by that time. It's interesting because Marcello was considered a very powerful boss, but the situation and the way things were playing out in New Orleans in the 1960s could really be compared to L.A. In, uh, under Pete Milano, where he's considered leader of a weak organization where you have people from other groups that are active there. And this might need to be edited out because it has shit to do with what we're discussing. But. One thing, too, is, you know, New Orleans had a lot of different Compaisani groups, and they had been there for decades. You know, we look around the country, we see certain families like Tampa, Pittston, I mean, all around the country where they're very much centered on one or, or a group of neighboring Compaisani groups. But New Orleans, their membership might have been somewhat diverse even early on in terms of guys from different Sicilian hometowns making up the family. We have indications they were never a particularly big family, but that might not have been the case early on, given how many people were coming and going. Uh, but they, they might have recruited from a pretty broad array of Sicilian hometowns very early in its history, in contrast to families who formed later and were centered around one particular migrant group something to consider that's very possible because new orleans from the 1830s until eight the 1870s was really the premier city of sicilian immigration into america after 1872 is when the dam broke and you start seeing pop-ups in texas and san francisco up the ohio river valley you know the east coast but new orleans was really the premier city so it makes sense that you know people from all different regions would have ended up there mm -hmm. yeah you see sicilians from all over sicily including eastern sicily you know uh, uh messina province catania province and so forth uh everybody was in new orleans and there was some number of mainlanders also we don't really see them as uh members you know from what we know later on um, so we don't really know what relationships they had to the mafia. But from what I've seen, it, there was few, um, apparently, southern mainlanders, like Nabolidani, Calabresi, Pugliese. It seems like there were mostly Sicilians, but a, a limited but influential number of northern Italians who were interacting mm -hmm. closely with the Sicilians, which is another thing that we also see early on in uh, Chicago. And I would suspect there was some of that in New York also, you know. And then we have that reference on the DiCarlo tapes where he's talking about New Orleans and he's like, they're all greenhorns, they're all grease balls. And that's in the 1960s. This is a family who'd been around for a hundred years at that point. Yeah. And I know there was one guy, I'm, I'm blanking on his name. I think he attended Appalachian, but he, I believe he was Calabrian and he's believe, he used an alias, which is why I always forget his name. But he's one of the only mainlanders that we know of who was most likely, I mean, he was definitely a New Orleans member. But they didn't diversify like you would expect a family who had been in America to have, quote unquote, Americanized at a quicker rate than other families like we see in cities like New York and Chicago. But it seems like they kind of stayed closer to the Sicilian route. And uh, that DiCarlo reference is interesting just because he, he's saying almost all of them, except for one or two guys, are greaseballs. And Greenhorn was used in Chicago and in other places, um, you know, colloquially just had to refer or it was almost like zip, but it didn't mean mafia necessarily, right? It was guys, uh, you know, it was people who were first generation immigrants from uh, from Sicily or, or Southern Italy. Um, you know, they're still green, you know, they're not Americanized yet. And it, it, from what we can see with what we know about New Orleans by the 1960s, they certainly don't seem to be. As Angelo said, some of them are multi-generation Sicilian Americans, but it's possible that a guy like DiCarlo, who was of mainland ancestry, may have seen them as being very Sicilian and very traditional, even if they weren't born in Sicily. 
Um, but, but it the comes Calabrian, to the Calabrian thing is interesting. So I just wanted real quick, if we're going to talk about the 1960s stuff, um, with the Calabrian thing, it's worth noting also that Carlos Marcello, as Angelo mentioned, he had links to, uh, to families like Chicago, uh, the Genovese family. And specifically, he was linked as a partner of, um, you know, of, of Frank Costello, as well as uh, Chicago Capodicina for Chicago Heights, uh, Vincenzo Amirato, uh, Jimmy Emery. And both of those guys were from Cosenza province in, in, in Calabria. So there could be some, you know, I mean, certainly even if their membership was was mostly Sicilian, they they had no problem working with, with Calabresi, right? At least not and the Marcia. DiCarlo thing, it came up in context with they were talking about at that time, DiCarlo was uh, going to be joining the Freemasons. And so they're talking about mafiosi joining the Freemasons. And it, it comes up because they say New Orleans didn't allow their members to join the Freemasons. And interestingly, Nino Calderone, who was a Sicilian mafia pentito, he talked about how there was an old rule in the Sicilian mafia that said you couldn't join the Freemasons. We know they did later. So that indicates that rule carried over to the United States and the New Orleans stayed true to that, at least into the 1960s. Just a tangent there, but it tells you it's not just that they were still very much Sicilian centric, but they also maintained this old rule against mafiosi joining this other club, this other organization. Yeah, I suspect that the Greenhorns thing was was, was less an accurate reflection of, of again of their birth, right? The fact that you know that we they don't we don't see a bunch of uh, first generation you know people in in New Orleans, right? But we do see um, that they seem, from what little we know, to really sort of conform to a, a very conservative, traditionally minded Sicilian family, despite the fact that they've been in New Orleans since like around 1850. So not just the. It's interesting you bring up the you know the prohibition on uh, on on a membership in Freemasonry. I mean, otherwise, also they seem very conservative and, and old school in the sense that, as far as we can tell, they have a very small membership. As Angelo brought up, we don't know how big their membership was at the time of this letter in 1909, right? But um, it seems that they made very few people. They were very conservative about that, right? Which is a, another sort of traditional feature. Well, Greenhorn could have referred to Carlos Marcello himself, since he was. Uh, yeah. Born in Tunis. So, yeah, and, it's, it's a parents from Abigento. Yeah, and there were uh, probably most of the other members were uh, American born uh, by that time. Yeah. You know, just to give a little bit of background on the, uh, on the New Orleans Mafia, it, it appears that there were only a small number of, of towns, you know, back in the uh, earliest days that were. Uh, Seem to be involved with it. Uh, Germany, Marisi, Palermo, Monreale, and uh, uh, Contessa and Tolina, yeah, and a few other towns, uh, but it, it seemed to be limited to that, uh, to those towns in the beginning. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if the uh, 1891 lynching had a significant effect uh, on the membership of the family, you know, probably. A number left just for their own safety, you know, so that they could have gone on to places such as St. Louis or Chicago. You know, we don't have records for where they went, but uh, obviously, some like Vincenzo Moretti stayed on. You know, uh, people that were well placed and highly regarded. So that that could have made a difference, and and that could have. Uh, you know, altered his thinking to keeping the family relatively small. Yeah. I mean, that, that was, I mean, because, I mean, people would invoke that. When I looked into Birmingham, there was a, some sort of influential figure who tried to recruit Italian workers to Birmingham and the locals threatened them and said, you know, we'll do to you what we, what happened to those mafiosi in New Orleans if you do that. So that was something that was invoked nationally to scare Italians. And I'm sure it had a significant effect on the New Orleans family. Yeah, it almost caused a war between the United States and Italy. Wow. And uh, there was, uh, a few years later, there was another lynching of Italians. Uh, so, but that was the largest one. It was one of the uh, largest in the U.S., yeah, and in the 1920s, there was uh, what seems to have been a war in downstate Illinois, 
um, between uh, the KKK and uh, what were called Italian bootleggers or black handers in the local uh, newspapers. Um, and we know there was a significant Sicilian colony, including a lot of people from Agrigento, far downstate Illinois, in the area around Johnston City and Marion. Um, and uh, I believe the, the mayor of Marion was assassinated. So there was like a several years shooting war between the, the, the Ku Klux Klan and, um, and local Italians who were mostly Sicilian. And there does seem to have been a, a mafia presence there. So um, in you know, Southern Illinois is culturally, you know, historically essentially part of the South. So this was, uh, you know, there was ongoing tensions, um, you know, between uh, sort of racist nativist uh, backlash, um, you know, especially after uh, World War One, that would have been sort of, uh, you know, coalesced around the reborn uh, KKK. But I mean, obviously, in 1891, New Orleans, it predates that. But there was, uh, you know, places in the South, I think we talked about this before with Birmingham, uh, you know, there was a lot of... Uh, a lot of resentment, a lot of uh, nativist backlash against uh, especially Catholic and, you know, Southern European immigrants. Yeah. And by the time of this letter, uh, Jim Crow was in full effect. Yeah. 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 This is the context. I mean, it's uh, New Orleans is sort of an, an island in the South because of its multicultural history, but it is still in the South, right? You know, some people have uh, culturally linked it to the Caribbean more than the, uh, the Anglo-American South. It's, it's, I think I think it has a foot in one and a foot in the other in some ways. It is a, yeah, and a different place. Of, of Italian and Sicilian saloon owners yeah. often getting in trouble uh, with the law for uh, giving alcohol to black customers in their saloons. Yeah, and there was Sicilians involved in the earliest uh, jazz that we know about. I mean, there was I believe club owners. There were Sicilians that were uh, that were members of jazz bands. So there was um, not that it was a, a racial utopia between Italians and and uh, and you know uh, blacks in the South and you know Louisiana, but uh, you know there was there were interesting cultural exchanges, right? Yeah. And all this is sort of happening within the context of a mafia that probably had some some relationship to some of these clubs that I would imagine jazz was being played in. Yeah, Louis Armstrong actually, uh, I believe. Uh, one of his first jobs was working in a club managed by a, uh, I believe, by a member of the Matranga family. Mm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. We know that later on, of course, in you know New York and Chicago, I mean, the mob also controlled uh, a lot of jazz clubs. And, uh, you know, some members of Jewish organized crime or people connected to them also controlled clubs and had a lot of interest in, um, you know, records and jukebox and so forth. Right. So there's a long history of the mafia involved with american music and they had a lot of influence in different eras but the jazz thing is interesting again new orleans is sort of a different kind of place but uh yeah i mean we don't think of the mafia as a southern phenomenon right but its oldest manifestation in the u.s was undeniably in the south i hear in your letter that sunday three friends left to go and see him i will await patiently the answer and hope for favorable results am in doubt that one of my letters may be lost because as i had to say in a previous one to the last i had spoken also of the agreement i had made with caligeral golota in fact he told me in this his last that no other letter of mine had he understood what i said yeah now we could see that this could be an example of the secret service secret service uh, intercepting some of the letters, you know, uh, the letter we uh, discussed last week and this letter, I believe, were taken together uh, when the uh, Morello household was uh, raided by the Secret Service. And so, uh, yeah, so uh, communication between the different families was often blocked because a uh, letter was one of the primary ways of uh updating uh the families and so they'd be left in the dark without this information and some of the information could be pretty significant uh i'd say this letter about reorganizing the family was very significant so uh so vincento Moretti had to do it on his own apparently you know maybe another letter got out from a member of uh, morello's borgata you know, to let him know what's going on.
and uh, and also we see mention of a uh, Caledro Gulata, who was a relative, I, I believe, a cousin of Giovanni Gulata. Uh, uh, Caledro Gulata lived in New Orleans, unlike uh, Giovanni, who lived in Bogalusa. And uh, I believe Caledro Gulata's son was uh, a very important criminal defense attorney in New Orleans. Yeah, I don't know if it's the same if it's the same guy, but there was a Calodro Gulota who arrived in New Orleans uh, from Palermo in 1906. He was born about 1871. I don't know if it's the same guy or not. Um, I'm not familiar with him, but the, sh the the passenger manifest for his arrival in New Orleans says that his last residence was Palermo, as in the city of Palermo. That doesn't say I don't know if he was born there necessarily, but I wonder. Um, but that you know the. I do. I, I recall that the the, the, the Giovanni Golota was from was from Sambuca, but um, um, you're saying that the the Calodro Golota that he's referring to here was also from Sambuca. I, I honestly well, don't know. You know. Yeah, it doesn't give us additional information, so it I'm doesn't. Yeah. Coming to that conclusion that uh, because uh, when I looked through the early newspapers, that uh, I believe that Calodro Golota. Uh, was a uh, cousin of his. Okay, that would make sense. Yeah, so I don't think I, I have anything else to add. Um, you know, for the, for the last paragraph. Yeah, if they were from yeah. different, if they were from different uh, towns or lived in different towns, I and mean, we know that happened. You know, we know a lot of times mafios who were concentrated in their, them and their relatives were concentrated in the same town, but we know there was interrelation between towns that didn't even neighbor one another. A good example of that is in Tampa, where uh, the Italianos were from Santo Stefano uh, in uh, Agrigento, but then they had immediate relatives with the surname Italiano in Belmonte Mazzano, which is a, a different part of Palermo province, a different province, but it doesn't even border Agrigento. So we, we do see that. So, you know, it's definitely, and then people had reasons to go to Palermo. You know, guys from different areas of Sicily had reason to move to Palermo. We know that wasn't entirely uncommon i don't have anything really to say about this paragraph he says three friends left to go and see him you know there's an implication there are three amici probably referring to members um so he's discussing this issue probably with constantino again saying there was some kind of delegation sent but yeah i don't have anything to add on that one okay hmm. you know it's interesting i'm sorry i actually was just looking at some some records for uh, Louisiana, and I, I, you know, I would want to confirm this, you know, using uh, actual birth records from Sicily if they're available online. But there's stuff uh, referring to Giovanni Gulotta, who lived, who died in Bogalusa, Washington Parish, Louisiana, 1927, as actually being from Corleone, hmm. which would make sense. If that's true, it would make sense then that that um, Morello is taking a very personal interest in him as well as Constantino, because as we discussed in our previous discussion, that is uh, related, you know, to the um, the Corleone, you know, Paisani network. If if uh, Calogero Constantino was in trouble and was hiding out with Giovanni Golota in Louisiana, that might make sense also. So, yeah. I mean, Galota is, is found in different places. I, I, so I can't confirm 100% that he was Corleonesi. And I, I have come across references to Galotas in New Orleans connected to the mafia who were said to be from Sambuca. So maybe somebody, maybe it's different people or maybe somebody was wrong, you know? Yeah, I did mention yeah. that Giovanni Galota was uh, related by marriage to the Salta Formaggio family, which was there from Corleone and, and they yeah. were themselves related by marriage to the Morello Terranova family. Yeah, you did say that. So that would make sense. So this is uh, this is sort of, uh, I guess, historical research in the making, you know, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a lot of and I'll be the first one to admit that. I mean, a lot of this early New Orleans stuff, I, I barely know the surface of it, you know. I end this moment by sending you the most cordial greetings of mine and my family to you and all your family and pray you make it known also to the friends Zito, Piero, Sonziri, Berati, and their families as also Vito De Giorgio. <laughs>
it's it's interesting where it's mentioned of Vito Di Giorgio, uh, who I wrote an article about as being the uh, first known boss of Los Angeles. Uh, he had quite a history. He was born in 1880 in Borghetto and uh, obviously uh, became a very significant player in New Orleans. It's possible for a brief time that he was even the boss of New Orleans. Uh, we don't have confirmation of that, but there's a lot that we don't know uh, in, for during different periods, especially after Vincenzo Moretti was killed in 1915. So we have kind of a, a gap of information. Uh, Vito Di Giorgio, we also see in uh, in Morello's prison records. Uh, Giuseppe Morello went to prison in 1910 for counterfeiting. Uh, there was a lot of exchange uh, between him and Di Giorgio. So for some reason, they were very close. You know, we don't have information about that. Um, I refer to him uh, very affectionately in his letters. So that that could have helped propel uh, Di Giorgio to advance in the New Orleans family. You know, maybe even to uh, Los Angeles later on, but it, it didn't end up saving his life. And eventually Morello himself was killed in 1930. Uh, the other names, Cito, uh, Puro Sinceri Benanti. Uh, there are several Zitos and, uh, and Sinceri, so it's hard to specify who uh, was being referred to there. Uh, Benanti. I'm not sure about either, but Piero most likely was Vincenzo Piero, who was close to Vito Di Giorgio. Uh, he came from Montreal, and he appears to have later moved to Los Angeles around the same time Di Giorgio did. And uh, his uh, children married uh, the children of other leaders uh, within the mafia that uh, Tony and Eric could probably get into. So I'll let them cover that. Yeah, that's, I mean, the assumption here is that, again, that, yeah, the, the, the Piro would be Vincenzo Piro, who was from Moriali. And there's a reference in the letter above, as we already noted, to, uh, to some events happening in Moriali that the, that uh, Morello is asking um, uh, uh, Morici about, right? And and as Rick already noted earlier, Moriali is one of the the towns that is uh, seems to be prominent in the early New Orleans mafia. It's also, I mean, a complete hotbed of mafia activity. Um, not, and, and you'll hear us say that because a lot of the people we, we discuss in these older, um, you know, events and so forth do come from a lot of these like hardcore mafia centers in, in Western Sicily. But not every town was had had the same sort of level of mafia, you know, presence or activity. Um, we said Termini Marezzi was one. Uh, you know, Corrione obviously was one and, and Muriali was another one um, just outside of Palermo and essentially, uh, you know, along the, the sort of what they called the Conca de Oro, like the gold, the, the golden shell, which was a heavy, heavy citrus producing industry that was uh, has been identified by a number of, you know, historiographers as one of the cradles of, uh, of, of the mafia in the 19th century. And uh, I believe that Vincenzo uh, Piro, and when he was in New Orleans, was uh, also involved in the produce industry, as was uh, typical um, for a lot of uh, you know early mafiosi in New Orleans and in some other cities. So one of his daughters married um, Antonino Musso, um, who, at least by 1930, we understand, is the was the boss of the Rockford, you know, mafia family in Illinois, and another daughter married uh, Tony Lombardo who was from Messina province in Sicily and uh, became the boss of the Chicago mafia uh, sometime around 1924 to 1925, according to Nick Gentile, after the, the death of uh, the previous boss, Michele Merlo. And of course, he was later killed in 1928, which anybody that knows about the sort of Chicago prohibition era stuff, he's a very, very important person, uh, was reputedly very close to Al Capone. Um, yeah, so the, the Piro family seems to be very well connected. He's getting an explicit shout out, um, apparently from, uh, from Morello. Uh, two of his daughters marry guys that wind up becoming bosses of other families. He uh, 
moves to New Orleans sometime around 19, uh, sorry, to Los Angeles sometime around 1920, as Rick said. He also has a son, Giovanni or John Piero, who stays on in Los Angeles. Um, and he was the Gumbada. He was the co-godparent with uh, Chicago boss, Tony Lombardo, and traveled to Chicago to, mm. to baptize one of his, to baptize his son, his firstborn son with Tony Lombardo. So that, that shows you the sort of network of links, again, that sort of linked, uh, you know, some of these guys connected with families in different cities where they were creating essentially fictive kinship relations through uh, co-godparenthood, right, as Gumbadi. So uh, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, and it's interesting that both Piro and Vito de Giorgi, I mean, Vito de Giorgi was from, um, you said was from Borgetto, right? Yeah. yeah. A very small town. It's essentially a satellite of 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 Partenico, but it has its own mafia family, as far as we know, that goes back. Um, in modern times, all of these remain important um, towns with important mafia families. Um, you know, Borgetto pops up throughout the history of the American mafia in a number of families. Um, so it's interesting to see already that there's an early boss, right, that's from there. But it's also from Partenico to Borgetto and then into Monreale, right, there's a sort of line of connection. So it's unsurprising also that uh, the Pito family and the and Di Giorgio might have been connected to each other personally. They're not from the same town, but there's clusters of towns that have close associations. And I think Borgetto and Monreale would be unsurprising as places that would be in, uh, in contact with each other in Sicily and then, you know, continuing after their arrival in the U.S. So these these letters are interesting, little shout outs, but they, they tell us something about the network, right? They indicate these, these guys were probably made. For one, well, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. that's, that's probably pretty obvious. But uh, yeah, just looking at these names, I mean, I don't know who the Zito and Sonsiri are, but you mentioned, you know, Piero had interrelation with Musso, who became the Rockford boss. And Zito and Sonsiri are names that show up in San Giuseppe Iato, which inform Rockford heavily. And I uh, don't know if they also show up elsewhere, but Nante is a name that shows up later in New York from Bauchina which heavily connected to Corleone as far as affiliation goes. But Vito De Giorgio is interesting. You know, I recommend Rick, as he mentioned, wrote an article about him for Informer. Uh, he was in New York a few years before this, and his brother-in-law, you know, Tony just mentioned that Borgetto, basically the same town as Partinico, and, and a guy named Leonardo Cipolla came to New York where he arrived to Vito De Giorgio, listing him as a brother-in-law. Don't know if that relation is accurate, but around a decade later, Leonardo Cipolla came to New Orleans where he was identified along with De Giorgio as basically the, the two top guys in the family. And Cipolla though was heavily connected to the Bonanno family. He was likely a member. He was very close to Niccolo Shiro who had re relationships to Partinico. So there's a there's a Bonanno connection in there as well, and then in the 20s, uh, Filippo Rappa, who was a mafioso in Borgetto, came to the U.S. and by the 1930s, he's the conciliary of the Bonanno family. So there's a strong Bonanno connection here. Um, you know, hard to say what Vito De Giorgio's connection to it was, but through Cipolla, maybe there's something. And uh, uh, Cipolla ended up being a suspect in the Vincenzo Troia murder, or he was, he was questioned in relation to it in Newark in the 1930s. And Troia was from San Giuseppe Iato. So we see a lot of these same hometowns that we're discussing here show up in connection to the same people. And uh, I want to go back to, I mentioned Vincenzo Capetta was involved with the New Orleans family. He was arrested with the Giorgio in 1908. The following year, Capetta's in Kansas City, He's one of these journeymen who bounces between New York, New Orleans, Kansas City. He's then in Pueblo. Then he's back in Kansas City. Then he's in St. Louis. He was a very important guy. We don't know if he ever held a, a high-ranking position, but in the network, he was certainly a very important guy. He, he went to a, 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 a meeting held by the Capo de Capi in New York in 1912. And I do think there's something to what Morello said about the guys who don't want to join can leave, basically. I think Capetta might, might well have not wanted, he, he might not have accepted the status quo after Motizi left, because we know that De Giorgio wanted to kill Vincenzo Capetta in 1922 based on some sort of vendetta with roots in New Orleans, but they hadn't lived in New Orleans together since 19. 
1908 or 1909. So it could have roots in what's being discussed here. And uh, Nicola Gentile had to intervene and save Capetta's life because uh, De Giorgio wanted him dead after 15 years. So there was stuff going on here that we don't know about. There, there was bad blood. There's bad blood. And again, there's a lot of dense interconnections between some of these towns that go back to Sicily, sort of get remixed in the connections that they forge between different American cities and different American borgata. And that goes back to Sicily and then comes back and, and you know, over and over. We're seeing, you know, Morello referring to events both in the U.S. and in Palermo here. Right. These things are happening in concert with each other. I don't th I don't think I said it earlier, but Tony Musso, the, the Rockford boss who married one of Vincenzo Piro's daughters, he was also from Partenico. So that's right. Again, right next door. Borgetto is basically like a satellite of it. And we know that there's a lot of dense connections. I see Monreale as sort of like a portal from the Palermo metropolitan area and like the Conca de Oro surrounding it out west. So the whole this whole dense mafia sort of mafia infested historically um, like network work of towns you know going so the, from road, the road that, yeah. the road that, the main road that, that leaves palermo through monreale yep. goes straight to Partenico. Yep. and those towns show up in close connection they're basically the same network yep. and then years later in new orleans in the 1940s frank coppola who's you know a very infamous journeyman who was deported yep. drug trafficker he moves to new orleans and transfers membership he's he's one of the leading figures in the Partenico network so we yep. see Partenico show up over a span of many years, uh, whether, you know, Coppola had connections to everybody, but yeah. he was heavily connected to the Detroit Partenico element. St. Louis had an early element from there and he was involved with them. So many years after these guys are there, you know, we have Coppola showing up. Leonardo Cipolla was from Partenico. Borgetto is basically yep. Partenico, even though it had its own family and its, its own identity. So that seems to have played an important role in, in New Orleans spanning years. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and Partenico is, I think, really pretty much right at the center of one of the densest concentrations of like old mafia, you know, families and networks. Um, you know, we've identified, discussed what we call the Chicago Triangle, you know, which is also connected to Kansas City and to Milwaukee and in some other places. Um, and also New Orleans, of course, right? But that's, you know, you know Bagaria, Termini Marezi, Cacomo, Chimina to the east of Palermo. And then to the west of Palermo, again, I mean, these were really, really uh, important towns that were, you know, uh, you know, essentially full of he really heavy mafia activity. From Partenico to the east is Moriali, also Piano de Greci, to the south is San Giuseppe Iato and San Ciparello, to the, you know, to the west is Alcamo, and then right past Alcamo is Castel de Mare de Golfo. You know, Campo Reale is to the southwest, um, which is, you know, also an important part of the early Bonanno family network. So, I mean, if you look at Partenico on the map, you'll see the, not only is it itself an important center, but it's it connects in almost every direction. So the north is, you know, Chinisi and, you know, Monte Le Pre and Terracini and all these towns, which also, you know, especially, uh, you know, Chinisi and, and Terracini are very important in the early history of the Detroit family. Well, not just the early history up until today, right? And, you know, St. Louis. So, um, you know, it's unsurprising that you're gonna see a lot of these connections you yeah, know, Frank, you know, Frank Coppola, like this, you yeah. know, one of the Frank Coppola's longtime close friends, they were both deported around the same time, who was the boss in New Orleans, was uh, Sam Carollo. Carolla, I, I can't remember yeah. the vowel, but uh, he was from Terracini. So we well, see that. Yeah, and, and so the Chipola that, that was connected to Vito de Georgia, after he went to New Orleans, he, so, so just to also, I don't think we brought it up, and I don't know if we were going to it towards the end, but... Vincenzo Morici, you know, the, the New Orleans boss, who's the, the intended recipient of this letter from Morello, he's murdered in New Orleans in 1915, right? Um, that's my understanding. I don't know, the maybe Rick knows more about the context of how why he was killed, but I, I, I feel like I've come across something stating that Cipolla either had knowledge of this or was connected to it somehow. I don't think he was there yet, was he, Rick? 1915? He was still in New York. He was still in New York. Okay. I want to say he was still in New York around World War One, but he had to have gone to New Orleans immediately after. I think maybe he was connected to somebody that was like probably the Georgia was still. I think the Georgia was still in New Orleans in 1915, right? Yeah, I mentioned the uh, the Marecci murder in 1915, and uh, okay. there was a, an entire series of murders that took place around that time. Yeah, and uh, what's believed to be the uh, the axe murder uh, the, from the axe man of New Orleans. Right. Uh, that was going on, and uh, 
there were some possible connections between uh, uh, some of the supposed axe murders and the mafia. So that's a whole other topic. But it's interesting how it's all connected. Yeah. Yeah, there was a murder in Chicago in 1911 um, that was supposedly linked or committed by um, uh, Pietro Mantobano, who was a notorious Chicago mafioso from Castel Vetrano um, in, in Parvini. That was the guy's uh, head was bashed in by an axe. So, you know, there, there seemed, I mean, I don't know if it was always uh, the typical MO of a mafia murder, but, you know, they're definitely, uh, it just made me think of that, that some of these early murders, some of them were, you know, just sort of uh, a lot of, most of them were shotgun blasts and some of them were revolver shots, but other ones could be really brutal, maybe depending on whether they wanted to send a message or not, you know? Yeah. And axes were tools of convenience. I mean, they were pretty common back then. Yeah. You could carry one without arousing suspicion. It wouldn't be considered a weapon, you know? I'd like to say one thing regarding um, that area of where Trapani and Palermo provinces meet. Um, we see that being the makeup of the Detroit family. And for a long time, people have always assumed that it was one cluster or one faction. But it appears that there was a division between guys from Trapani and guys from northwestern Palermo, like Terracini and other places. Um, I spoke to or I asked I asked um, Frank Fiordolino a question about that, given his ties to the Trapani region. And I asked him if him or anybody he knew had connections to places like Terracini or Partinico or any of those places. And he responded, no, which on its surface doesn't mean anything, but it could point to existing patterns going back prior because it does seem like people from Castellamare, Alcamo, all the way, you know, Monte San Giuliano, compared to Terracini, Favarota, um, Chinisi, that appeared to have been like a separate, they were distinct. And if you go to New York, you see that guys from Terracini, like the Balsamos, I believe he was from Terracini. If not, he's from somewhere around there. It's yeah, he was well. from Terracini. Sorry? Yeah, he was from Terracini. The uh, uh, the Balsamo uh, referred to in the uh, uh, the well-known book, <laughs> yes. Bill Balsamo. Well, the Balsamos were from there. There were also people from Partinico that were with the Gambinos and not the Bananos like you would think they were if Eastern Trapani and Western Palermo province were one cluster of alliances. That's all I had to say. Yeah, yeah. I should mention yeah. the Partinico was linked to uh, the Skiro group. So uh, Early on you're in with Costantino, yes. Well, I should mention too, Leonardo Cipolla, he was murdered in 1943 for reasons unknown. So he's he's likely a former high-ranking New Orleans member who's originally in Williamsburg, where he, he went to Sicily with Shiro in the 30s after Shiro had stepped down. And then he comes back, he's linked to the Vincenzo Troia murder, which also had other links to the Bonanno family. He's killed under mysterious circumstances in the 40s. There were a bunch of these Partinico guys connected to the Bonanno family who got murdered in the 30s and 40s. It makes me wonder if that led to them gravitating toward a different network. Maybe Joe Bonanno didn't didn't like their influence because we know they were very powerful early on. Uh, Griffin and I have been doing some research kind of related to this, and it seems like maybe Bonanno wanted to cut that early power base off. Who knows? Because um, that group was very influential. Yeah, Bonanno does it. Joe Bonanno, he does it even in the narrative of his memoir, where he repeatedly refers to his family as the Castel de Marais family, right? And and it's if you read that memoir and nothing else, you're going to think that the entire history of that family was was centered only around men from Castel de Marais de Golfo, right? And not from, you know, Partinico and Campo Reale and places like that. Um, you know, that may be intentional. Again, sort of pointing out what Eric said. I mean, that was a, an alternative power base, 
So it's interesting. I mean, they're, they're, they, they appear together in some cases, but they also, of course, they form their own sort of clusters of, of networks. And we see that in Detroit, as Angelo said also, right? And something strange about New Orleans, speaking of Shiro, is Shiro's cousin, Jack Rizzuto, whose brother was likely a Bonanno member. But Jack Rizzuto leaves Williamsburg. He goes to Kansas City, where he's, he's never been confirmed as a member, but he was active in bootlegging. He ends up moving to New Orleans, where a source says he's one of the top mafiosi before he dies in the 50s. But his son, Phil, who gets listed as a suspected New Orleans member, I got a hold of a report from 1983 where Phil Rizzuto is identified as a Louisiana-based Kansas City member. So they might have had remote members of other families living in New Orleans. Um, maybe it was hard to get made. Maybe, you know, may, we know remote members lived in different places around the country, but it opens the possibility that there were other remote members living there who were part of the local scene. You know, Jack Rizzuto gets mentioned. I know he bounced back and forth between New Orleans and Kansas City. But the fact that his son way later is made in Kansas City, but he lives in Louisiana is very intriguing, to say the least. Eric, I wanted to follow up on you mentioned Griffin. And for the listener, Griffin is somebody that we work with who's an expert on the Bonanno crime family. Yep. Griffin's the man. One yeah, other thing I'd like to reasons. say is that um, Nick Skiro, he had a nephew who was down in New Orleans who actually served time in prison twice, but there's nothing to confirm that he was ever a member. So Skiro okay. had relatives down in New Orleans as well. And the mayor of uh, New Orleans, I think when Mar Marcello was the boss, was a Shiro who uh, his family was from Contessa Antolina, which is an Arborish colony. And I believe you guys found that, that Nick Shiro, his family had roots in Contessa when they came from Albania. So he could be a relative too, for all we know. He was an associate of the New Orleans family, not made, but he was the mayor and definitely helped the family out. So there's, there's a lot of Bonanno connections there that haven't really been, I mean, we'll probably never know truly what was going on, but th there are Bonanno connections there. Which Mayor Skiro was a, a relative. You know, I think I, I found that a long time ago. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, Skiro is definitely an, an Arboreshi, so an ethnic Albanian surname. And Eric just mentioned Contessa and Talina. Um, you know, I've, I've seen some some articles, uh, you know, from the 1890s into the you know, 1900s in New Orleans that refer, I, I noted earlier that Vincenzo Morici was the president, you know, for a period of the uh, Termini Merezi Society in New Orleans. And uh, one of the societies that they were, uh, that they held functions and events with was the Confessa and Salina Society. So um, the fact that these societies are named shows you that they are some of the more important Paisani groups involved in, uh, you know, things like the Columbus Day Parade and, and associated, uh, you know, major activities in the community. Okay. Yeah. Looks like we got one paragraph left. Yeah. Go ahead, Angelo. They will also receive many greetings of my brothers and brothers-in-law and my son, Kalidu, my godfather, Angelo Lagatura, and all of the friends of Merit. Many greetings yet from all of the friends of New Orleans that you think. To you, a warm kiss, your affectionate friend. Signed, G. LaBella. We've already gone over most of the content. There isn't really much to say here. Uh, uh, we briefly mentioned Angelo Lagutuda uh, as being as an important person in New York. Um, uh, if I recall correctly, he was he was associated with the uh, uh, counterfeiting scheme that they that Morello and Lupo were involved with. And uh, he later on moved to a different part of New York. And if I recall correctly, he was a very abusive father and ended up being killed by his own son. So that was uh, uh, many years later. I believe it was in the 20s or 30s that took place. Um, so these people weren't always the nicest of people. They were very dangerous individuals. So even though we look back a long time ago and 
uh, see it as a different time, you know, where uh, these people were were lethal. You know, they uh, they didn't hesitate to kill people, and uh, and a lot of them did take it out on their own families. So, um, but that's really all I have for about uh, this last paragraph. Yeah. I mean, it's an interesting sign off, right? Um, because it's also a sort of formal introduction, you know, uh, you know, via letter, not via person to, uh, so the son, Calido, this should be uh, Calogero uh, uh, Morello, right? Mm -hmm. The son of, yeah. uh, of, of Giuseppe, right? So, I mean, it's also, you know, he's, he's keen to insert his son as part of this network. So I mean, they're not in a position to do a formal introduction, um, but we know that introductions via letter right between american families and between sicily and the us were, were very common back in these times so it's interesting to note that um that uh it seems that morello is stating at this point that his son is made i believe his son was still a boy at that point oh was he okay okay, okay. well yeah how old was he at this point because we, we we have other information that's that says between about 13 and 17 a a, a kid could be made already um, yeah, I'm I'm not sure of his exact age. I'd have to yeah. uh, look it up. Um, and I do know that uh, a few years after this letter was written, while Morello was in prison, uh, he was killed. Uh, 1912. Yeah, so it's yeah, Khalidu Morello was killed in 1912. And uh, yeah, he could have. I mean, his his father was the national capo. So, if anybody's going to get made young, and we know they tended to make them young, it would be him. He might not. I don't know what his age was at this point. If he wasn't made yet, he's at least introducing him into the network, saying like, "My son, my son is 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 involved with us." I think is what that would imply. Um, I notice he says friends, or or he says all the friends of merit. You know, we know what that means. You know, friends of merit. Got to love the the flowery language in these letters. To you, a warm kiss. You know, I, I sign all my emails that way, so I get it. No, but uh, you see that a lot, though, where these guys, they, they these very warm, benevolent greetings. It's kind of like the false humility, too. I mean, on one hand, these guys were very affectionate and close to one another. I mean, they would, for photographs, they would link arm in arm. You know, they would do things that today we wouldn't think of as that masculine. But we know, you know, kissing each other on the cheek, you know, linking arm in arm, you know, that was that was kind of standard practice in those days. These guys didn't have to, to these guys had proved their manliness to each other, you know, through the mafia. But you still see that language, things that we would never say today to you, a warm kiss. I always just laugh at that. Yeah, letters were written in a more formal tone back then as well. So that was that was general across the world. Yep. Yeah, in any language. Um, and again, we have my godfather, Angelo Agatuta, and I think Rick earlier you know, stated, of course, we don't have the original Italian or if it had Sicilian terms in it also. We don't know what the original word would have been, and that actually would be important. I mean, Gatuta, La Gatuta was not, you said he wasn't, he's not much older than the Morello, right? Um, it very unlikely that he would be his his literal godfather. What's that? Sorry, Rick. Yeah, I believe it was similar in age. Similar, yeah, roughly. So he's not he's unlikely to be his literal godfather, right? And you know, otherwise, if he's actually saying padrino or something, you know, uh, equivalent, um, he could be indicating that that Gatuta sponsored him for you know for for membership. But we'd have to see what the actual original word word is. I I, I would suspect again that he'd be saying, you know, my gumbari, right? Yeah, they use Godfather to refer to somebody's sponsor into Cosa yeah. Nostra. Yeah. I'm, I'm forgetting where Lagatuta is from, but I don't think he's from Corleone. And we do have some information that Morello was inducted in Corleone before he came to the U.S. And I want to say it's either implied or a source might have even said that he was sponsored by his stepfather, Bernardo Terranova. So I don't think Lagatuta would have sponsored Morello, but I mean, he could be saying yeah. compare. Um, like, you guys said, you know, we don't know the actual word that was used. Um, right. You know, like like I earlier, there was an informant, I believe, around 1802, 1903, who 
got in and managed to hear their conversations and he noted that they all call themselves they all call each other godfathers so that stuck out to him but was he what was it being was he actually did he actually mean godfather like padrino or did he mean gombari that's the problem how well how well was that translated right we only have the english yeah it's, I know. You know, it's, it's possible lagatura was godfather to Kalidu morello i mean i don't yeah. maybe not i don't know where he was born but uh yeah, it's it's hard to, it's hard to gauge, and you know, even though it referred to a formal designation where somebody was the baptismal godfather to somebody's child, right? I've seen numerous transcripts where they use that to refer simply to a very close friend within the mafia. He's my gumbada. You know, we there's yeah. a reason why that the public even knows that term. It doesn't always refer to a formal relationship, but he he references it twice with lagatuda, which implies to me it's more than just my friend. There probably is some sort of relationship that we don't know. Yeah, there is a there was an Angelo Lagatura born about 1867 in New York City and uh arrived in the 1890s and he was he was from Godrano in Palermo province. I don't know if it's the same guy. Um it's not a super common name either. So and that's and and that's that's next to Cefaladiana, which is where later um I uh, believe that's where later, um, you know, Genovese, Masseria family, uh, 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 Consiglieri, Sao Palacci was from. Sao Palacci, I believe, was from Cefala Diana, if I'm not mistaken, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's that's an interesting area. It's close to, without getting on the Chicago stuff again, of course, it jumps out to me because that area around Cefala Diana, Mezzo Yuso, Mezzo Yuso, and, you know, being another one of these Arboreshi colonies. Uh, Albanian colonies. That's an area that had a lot of presence in Chicago, also. But it's essentially directly across the uh, the Ficuzza forest and hills from Corleone. Yeah, I believe he was from Mezzaluzzo. There you go. That, I mean, yeah. So I mean, it's right there. And 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 if 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 he was, and that the reason why that name might not be common, it might be of Arboreshi or Albanian origin. Well, you're you're sense. you're hitting on something. I'm I'm looking at Angelo yep. and Rick's informer article right yep. now, and. Angelo Lagatuta was involved in the war when Morello got out of prison, and uh, he and Severio Palaccio were both fired upon together. They were walking in the Bronx, and they were fired on, so they were obviously connected. Yeah, you, know, you just happened to bring them up because of hometowns, but uh, <laughs> there's obviously something to it because they were they were shot at together. Yeah, uh, Rick and Angelo said Lagatuta was born in Messina, but his family was from Mezzoyuso. Oh, interesting. Okay, so it, maybe it's an, it could be another Angelo Lagatuta, but if it's a name that's from that same area, around Mezzoyuso, that would make sense, because if it was, it probably was of, of Arboreshi, Albanian origin. And um, uh, Lagatuta was part of the faction who vowed to get revenge when Salvatore Loyacano was killed, who was the boss of the Morello family until he, until he was murdered in 1920. So he was part of that war that led to the formation of the Genovese and Lucchese families. Yeah, that's interesting, but it's important. I mean, Mezzo Yuso and Godrano, like I said earlier, there, there's like a, a wilderness area of hills and forest, um, the Ficuzza, which apparently had a lot of heavy mafia as well as uh, brigandage and bandit activity in the 19th century, early 20th century. It was sort of a notorious wilderness, like very dangerous area. That's uh, apparently like a lot of bodies were dumped there and killings happened there. And that's um, it's considered sort of like the you know the, the backyard of of Corleone, is my understanding. So that's Mezzo Yuso and Bodrano are right across from that. So even though we don't automatically think of them as being part of the Corleone area, um, it's you know it, it is actually I think within their sort of orbit, right? So again, talking about these sort of networks and the ways that certain you know in certain towns and certain families are more important within those, they're not all created equal. So Corleone I think was a sort of linchpin and. A number of surrounding areas were probably within its orbit. Um, we tend to see a lot of concentration of, uh, of of mafia connections in the U.S. around Arboreshi towns and families. This has come up repeatedly. It's very interesting because they're very endogamous. They tend to marry each other, right? So, I mean, uh, even families from different towns like Piana de Greci and Contessa Antelina, well, often Palazzo Adriano, they'll have intermarriages, the same surnames that pop up because they're ethnically Albanian and until some towns until today and in other towns like Mezzoyuso into the early 20th century maintained their own language, 
Um, they were Eastern Rite Catholics, so they had their own churches that were separate from the other Catholic churches. So they're they're an ethnic minority within Sicily, but were seem to have been fully immersed within the mafia. You know, um, within you know, it's funny because of course we know from like the U.S. mafia that there's a premium put on Italian ancestry, right? But these are people that at least up until relatively recently, I think, within Sicilian, you know, kind of folk ethnography, were not seen as Italian or Sicilian. They were Albanians and they identified as such, even though they had been in Sicily for a couple hundred years. So it's interesting yeah. to see somebody that might be from another one of these towns as part of the early Morello network, right? Yeah, Lagatuda, I believe, had actually Jewish ancestry when I looked up his name. Oh, interesting. Years ago. Well, there's quite a bit of that in the Rainbow province also, yeah. Yeah, I believe that there was a small Jewish population in Metsuhuso. And yeah. uh, uh, going way back. And uh, yeah, that's, that's interesting. I wonder if, you know. Name. I'm not sure if I included it in my article or not. Okay. Or, yeah. um, I may have mentioned it. You know, uh, you know, it's it's been a long time. Yeah, under the. Sense. Under the, the Muslim rule in, in Sicily, under the rule of, you know, essentially North African, um, you know, Muslims and, and Islamized Sicilians, you know, for a couple of centuries, there was a you know, significant Jewish population around Palermo, um, you know, most of whom, of course, were in the intervening centuries were were converted to, uh, you know, to Christianity, you know. Um, and so you'd wonder in a place like Mezzo Yusuf, if they got converted to the Eastern Rite or to the typical, you know, Catholic church. Because in some towns they had two churches, you know. That's kind of going off into the weeds, but it's a, it's an interesting thing because uh, you know uh, again, Mitzel Yuso is a place. It, it doesn't it doesn't come up a lot, as far as I can see, and a lot of other families in Chicago it was definitely a you know a place that was important. And uh, we also we also know that later on, um, Sal Palaccia was from Chefala Diana, and there's a lot of intermarriages I've seen in Chicago between um, people from Chefala Diana and Mitzel Yuso. They're right next to each other. He's he's actually killed by um he's murdered as we know from Nick Gentile by Vito Genovese along with Paul Rica. And had you know previously had traveled to Chicago I believe um, with uh, with Frankie Yale so he had a lot of connections there. You know in total you look at this letter you know it's there's less to analyze than the other letter we did but you can see that it's it's a crucial letter it involves a transition from the leadership the previous leadership to the new leadership. You know, it does seem, were you saying, Rick, that Marecci became the boss at this point? Yeah, I would, I'm not sure when he was elected boss, uh, but he was at least acting boss by this point. He may have been given permission, perhaps, to this letter. He was given permission to, um, that, that Morello gave his approval to become the official boss. Um, yeah, I get, yeah, my reading of it is that Morello's backing him He's right. not taking he's not taking a heavy hand in it, but he's he's at least providing political support. You know, just getting a letter saying, like I basically I'm authorizing you to reorganize the family speaks volumes coming from Morello. This is probably a lot of what he did. You know, when you think about his correspondence nationally, the other letter related to a very specific dispute and some of the politics and rules that relate to that. But this one, it, probably a lot of his letters were of this nature when, when a, there was a leadership transition. It was, you know, yeah, I'm giving you permission to reorganize the family. The people who are in line can join you and the people who aren't can leave. Um, it doesn't seem there's anything particularly volatile going on. You know, we know there's the Capetta situation, which may or may not relate to this. It doesn't seem like New Orleans was going to break out into warfare based on what's said in this, but it does show that, you know, how interconnected the politics were and the sort of role Morello played where he's clearly backing somebody, but he's also kind of letting the organization settle on its own as long as they do the right thing. Yeah, this letter's definitely connected to the other one. So uh, they help uh, complete the picture, you know, as best, you know, we can. And, uh, you know, a Morello giving his approval. I mean, we see that in modern times where the commission gives approval to a boss. You know, we saw that in the case of uh, Joe Magliocco uh, being denied, uh, you know, the headship of the what became the Colombo family. You know, they make a lot of uh, those are 
normal decisions for the commission. And so Morello as boss of bosses would be fulfilling that role. Yeah, yeah we know this. Go ahead, go ahead. So just, 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 just something on that. Like, and we know the commission backed Joe Colombo after Megliocco. And Joe Colombo did completely reorganize the Colombo family, where most of the captains were new under him. The administration was new. So we see that a new boss took over the Colombo family and heavily reorganized everything with the commission's backing. He still had to be elected, but just having the commission's backing was a significant factor in him becoming the boss. So something like this might have played out then. Yeah, that's a that's that's a good observation. As Rick said earlier, essentially the um you know a, a new boss had the prerogative to uh to sort of shape the family in his own image. It's a good way to put it, and I think that's an important thing. We can sort of we can see that being referenced here, like we can see sort of uh you know uh, evocations of it in Nick Gentile, and uh you know going back to the the role of Morello uh, as Capo de Capi and, and recognizing um you know a new boss in the family. Um, you know, as we understand, the Capo de Capi was essentially like the, the chief secretary or the chairman of the of the Gran Concilio. And as we've said before in other episodes, and we have good grounds to believe that the, the later commission from 1931 onwards was essentially a continuation or an adaptation of this older Gran Concilio model without a presiding chairman, even though they may have had a sort of secretary type role that sort of, uh, you know, kind of presided over the, the, the ceremonial aspects of it and, and rotated. Right. But there wasn't, um, you know, there wasn't a uh, like a chief of the, uh, you know, of the commission later in the same way. But, you know, we can see it fulfilling the same function here much earlier in 1909. And again, I mean, this and then the earlier letter to, you know, or the contemporary letter to Rosario Dispenza, they, as Rick said, they were probably seized at the same time by the, the Secret Service. Um, we see Morello engaging with different types of problems that involve uh, families. Right. We see him referencing events in, in Sicily. We see him essentially lending his political recognition to what we what we understand to be a new boss in New Orleans. And we also see him um, discussing some sort of problem that's happening with a member. We don't know of what family at that point with the boss of Chicago. Right. And if, uh, you know, if Calodro Constantino was a member at that point and had been inducted and, and whether he was a member of Chicago or New Orleans or one of the New York families, whether he was in good standing or had was on the run or what his, his actual situation was, if somebody was going to kill him, this would be something that later, presumably the commission would be involved in. Right. And this is something that in 1909, the boss of bosses as sort of chief of the Grand Concilio is concerned with something that has to do with some issue that re revolving on a member. Yeah, even yeah, Constantino is in another family's jurisdiction here, which is he gets referenced yeah. here. He's in New yeah. Orleans jurisdiction, but then New Orleans is undergoing a leadership change too. So things are complicated. Chicago's involved. Chicago's involved somehow. We know later on he winds up in Chicago and causes an issue with a kidnapping, right? And has to leave. Um, you know, but I mean, there's, there's, uh, you know, sometimes multiple interests. It shows just how, um, you know, procedurally minded, formal, and, uh, you know, organized, for lack of a better term, the mafia was in 1909. Again, just sort of to hammer home what we've said to people before, we're not just, it's not just our belief, right? We have some forms of evidence to really demonstrate. And we can see here, again, in action, the role of what, of what people call capo de capi, boss of bosses, or what, uh, you know, Bonanno referred to as Capo Conciliari, right? The chief counselor. All right, everyone. Well, that was the conclusion of the second letter. We hope you all enjoyed. Um, great thanks to Tony, Eric, and Rick for their expertise and explanations. And we wish you all a good night. Warm kisses, Giuseppe Morello style. <laughs> I, I, I'll leave those at the door. I don't know if I want any kisses from Giuseppe Morello. Because it could be the kiss of death, you know? You'll never make it as the capo de capi, man. You got to give those warm kisses in your letters. It could be the last kiss you get right there. Hold on, everybody. All right. All right.